All right. Can I introduce the two of you? And then I'm going to give you the stage and you've got it. How about that? Sounds good. Tom Morris is the author of Philosophy for Dummies and 30 other books. I think that's he he says he plays the guitar, but I think all he does is write. <laughs> and the thing is, you can't swing a dead cat in the town that I live in without running into somebody that's not worked with him on a book. I just a crazy thing. All right. He's a he was a philosophy professor at the University of Notre Dame and now heads the Morris Institute for Human Values. And his partner in crime today, Greg Bassam, is the author of Philosophy Book, an illustrated history of philosophy, and 10 other books. Greg was a professor of philosophy at King's College. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Tom Morris and Greg Bassam to the stage, which they're here. So yes, that's it. Do the power move. And it sounds like this. All right, my friends, you have the stage, you're on the clock. I'll just back out a little bit and you've got it, but I'm watching you. All right. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna share a screen now with everybody. I'm going to get started, then turn it over to, to Greg in just a second. But I hope you guys can see my screen just fine. We're going to talk about the practice of stoicism and stoic techniques. I got to tell you, it's quite a time for stoicism, right? I wrote my first book on Stoicism back in uh, 2004. I wrote it in the late 90s. It was published in 2004. Nobody was interested until later that year, Russell Crowe met Marcus Aurelius. You know the movie, Gladiator. Nothing like this had happened before. All of a sudden, the Stoics hit the big screen. And then last year, guys, the Audi... Q5 met the meditations. Have you have y'all seen this? Google Audi Q5 uh, commercial called Deliver Yourself. A young woman driving the Q5 through a beautiful landscape and she delivers a book to a friend's house. And look at what that book is. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And the sticky note on it says Deliver yourself. So there's all kinds of conversations on the internet. What does that mean? What does that mean? Is she delivering the book to her ex? Is she returning his copy? What's going on? And then this year, of course, the Christmas gift given by Paul Giamatti's character in The Holdovers, the new movie, is The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Some are happy to receive it. Others, not quite so much. Then we have all the celebrity Stoics of the present day. This has never happened before. Look at this guy on the left of your screen, an actor. Well, most people know him as Taylor Swift's ex, but anyway, he's an actor, Loki in the Marvel Universe. So then we have a politician, and then we have a politician and an actor, and then we have somebody who's neither. You could have multiplied these pictures on the screen of famous people who've suddenly gotten fascinated by Stoicism. So this time last year, I was asked to write a book. Stoicism for Dummies. The Dummies people called me up and said, should we do a book on Stoicism? It's really popular now. I said, yeah, I think you should. And they said, well, would you do it? 384 pages, you have six months. I said, I don't have time for that. But I know a guy. I know a guy. If we team up together, we may be able to do it. So I teamed with Greg. And you know what? The book came out January 11th. Y'all don't say anything about this because this is supposed to not be public knowledge, but in the early days, everybody was getting messages who had pre-ordered the book. There were tons of pre-orders. They were getting messages. Your order has been delayed. It was a mystery. It was a big mystery. And I got an email. An investigation is underway. It seems that an Amazon truck full of our book disappeared disappeared. Now, was this the Amazon truck, I wondered? Or maybe was it this truck? I don't know, but one way or another, Stoicism may have some new fans. It's become huge, you guys. You remember the original three famous philosophers, Socrates, know yourself, Plato with his cave, know your situation, Aristotle, know your strengths, your virtues, those guys have been eclipsed a little bit. The new three are Seneca, the lawyer, Epictetus, the freed slave, and Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about Stoic spiritual or psychological practices, what people are getting so excited about concerning these ancient philosophers. And I'm going to turn it over to Greg for about 10 minutes, and I'm going to do about eight minutes after that. And we hope to spark your imaginations and your thoughts to say some interesting things to each other today, as well as to us. Greg, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Tom. Uh, I, don't, I don't have uh, jazzy slides like you do. 
But let me just start with a, with a personal note, as you did. Uh, first of all, I, I, sh I should say that uh, I don't really consider myself a practicing Stoic, and, and I don't think Tom would either. Uh, we're both uh, longtime students and, and fans of Stoicism. We think it's one of the great wisdom traditions of, of the world. But if I were to characterize where I am philosophically, I would describe myself as a kind of Socratic skeptic. Uh, Socratic skeptic. I, I grew up in Oklahoma, the Bible Belt, four miles from Oral Roberts University, a wow. conservative evangelical Christian college there. And my father was a was a clinical psychologist. He was, in fact, he was a hardcore, old-fashioned Freudian atheist. My mother was an English teacher, and she was a kind of uh, a pantheist, a kind of pantheistic mystic who would go around saying things like, "The world is just God playing hide and seek with himself." So, as you can imagine, I grew up kind of confused, and when I got to High school age, I tried to read myself out of some of that confusion. And that's when I discovered Socrates, who made a big impact on me, but also Marcus Aurelius. I, I read Marcus Aurelius' meditations when I was when I was 17. And I thought, oh, dang, if this is philosophy, that's what I want to do for a living. And that's, that, that's what I did. I, I taught, taught philosophy for 35 years at, at four different universities, and I taught Stoicism Pretty much, pretty much every year. But uh, to get back to kind of my my assignment, I, I want to talk about uh, what it what it what it means to kind of be a practicing Stoic. Tom, can you can you flip to the next slide there, if you would, buddy? Sure, sure. Let me see. Let me get to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, what does it mean to be a practicing Stoic? I, I mean, there's different different ways of being a Stoic, and I suppose there's certainly different ways of being a a practicing Stoic, but uh, the way Tom and I think about it and describe it in the book is that a practicing Stoic is somebody who self-consciously applies basic Stoic teachings and practical techniques. Sometimes those techniques are called spiritual exercises or psychological practices uh, with the, the, the general goal of, of living a better, happier life. And I, I would just draw attention to, to two aspects of that definition. There's teaching, and then there's the, the practical part. Just like you can be a practicing Christian, a practicing Buddhist, where there's a certain amount of teaching or doctrine, certain core beliefs that you have. But then there's the whole practical, the lived component of being a, a practical Christian or a practical Stoic, or a Buddhist, rather. And I, I think uh, it works that way with, with Stoicism. But with Stoicism, I think there's a clear emphasis on the practice of, of, of Stoicism. The teaching is really intended to serve and to facilitate the practice, to live and be and think a Stoic in your, in your everyday life. So what, what are some of, these, some of these practical techniques? Let me just give two, two quick examples, uh, just by way of illustration. Tom's gonna talk about some of these techniques in greater detail. But two of them, the, the nightly review, the view from above. Many of you will be familiar with these, I'm sure. The nightly review is something that comes to us out of Seneca. And Seneca says that he, he actually borrowed this from a Pythagorean philosopher that he, he admired, a guy named Sextius. And, and the nightly review, as Seneca describes, it has a clear kind of ethical focus. It's a way of reviewing the day, asking yourself basic questions about the ethics of the day. What did I do right today? What did I do wrong today? What could I do better tomorrow? And it's all with the, the aim of living a, a better moral life. The view from above is, is, a, is, a, is a technique that the Stoics also borrowed from other philosophical traditions. Uh, it's a way of achieving what psychologists call a certain cognitive distance from certain things that may be troubling you or upsetting you. So you, you've had a bad commute to work, a rude driver cut you off, you find yourself kind of seething in the office for hours afterwards. What Stoics would recommend is you try and achieve a little bit of, of distance, a little bit of detachment from those negative kinds of feelings. Imagine yourself floating 
high into the sky and looking down on you sitting in your little cubicle in your office and asking yourself, is, is this going to matter next week? Is this going to matter in a thousand years? Why am I allowing this to, 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 to upset me? You know, it, it, it achieves that, that kind of, of detachment. You, you, you're able to recenter yourself a, as a result of it. Right. So just a, a, few, a few quick things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tom to get into kind of some of the nitty gritty of, of these practical techniques. Uh, as, as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, not all of these so-called stoic techniques were, were uniquely stoic by any means. Uh, a lot of them were, were borrowed from, from other rival philosophies of the day, from, from Platonism, from Pythagorean, from Epicureanism. These were all, all of these schools of thought were in constant communication and constant controversy with each other. And if one of the schools came up with a nifty technique, the, the other schools would, would borrow it. And that's the case here. Uh, also, there, there's no kind of official canonical list of, of stoic practical techniques. The guy who, who really first drew attention to these techniques, the, the great uh, French scholar Pierre Addo, identifies eight in his, in his first discussion of these. I've seen some, some, some books on practical stoicism to talk about 50 or 60 of them. I think 10 or 15 are, are the most commonly discussed. We actually explore 16 in our, in our book, and, and Tom will, will, will run through some of those. Also, there's, 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 some of these techniques are by no means accepted by all Stoics, either ancient Stoics or modern. For example, the practice of min minimalism or voluntary simplicity some Stoics are big into that, like Epictetus was, not so much for Seneca. Or I've seen some modern Stoicism books that talk about just tuning out the news, ignoring the news, stop paying attention to the news. Uh, that kind of run, con that run contrary to the, the general Stoic view that we should be active participants in, in political life. But it is, it is a way, of course, of, of achieving a certain freedom from disturbing news if you want to go that route. And finally, I, I think it's important to note that in most of the practical techniques that you see discussed in, in popular, popular presentations of Stoicism, it's, it's highly selective. There's, there's a good deal of cherry picking that's been going on. When you actually go back and read the, the classical Stoics, Seneca and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, there's a lot of stuff that they, they talk about, a lot of techniques involving moral moral training and intellectual training, for example, that are largely ignored in these lists. Uh, and then some of the stuff that makes uh, a lot of modern Stoics kind of uncomfortable, some of the themes in Marcus Aurelius. Marcus has some kind of gloomy, pessimistic themes in some of his writings. He talks about despising your flesh and how we should contemplate the eternal sameness of things, how we should recognize that there's nothing really new under the sun and so forth. Those kind of themes don't resonate with a lot of modern Stoics, and so they're simply ignored. So I think we, we do need to recognize that there's, there's a certain element of selection, a certain element of cherry picking that goes on in, in discussing these techniques. Turning it over to you, Tom. All right, man. So... You know, Greg has said something about why to why to be why be a practicing stoic. Some common motivations, you know, inner tranquility, mental calm, stress resistance, inner toughness. We say at the beginning of our book, some people come to stoicism to learn to cope. Some come to stoicism to learn to conquer. But actually, to do either, you have to do a measure of the other. And if uh, the Stoics had a slogan, I think it would be to cope and conquer with character because they believe that the inner is always the foundation for the outer. Uh, Stoics are after emotional self-control, behavioral self-control, psychological health. Ethical virtue is at the core. As a matter of fact, you go into most modern philosophy classes in most universities, you'd think philosophy is a way of thinking. For the Stoics, of course, philosophy was a way of living. It also involved disciplining your thinking, 
but philosophy was a way of life. I, I reread the Iliad and the Odyssey a few years ago. I, re I reread the Odyssey four times in one year in three different translations, the Iliad two times. The first hundred pages of the Odyssey, I never understood why they weren't really about Odysseus. They're about Telemachus, his son. Every stranger that comes to Ithaca, their island, their homeland, he asks him, have you seen my dad? Is my dad, Odysseus, dead or alive? Because Odysseus left when he was an infant. He hasn't seen his father. It's been almost 20 years. And Athena, who loves Odysseus, comes disguised as an old man, and like with any stranger, Telemachus comes up and says, do you know if my father is alive or dead? And she knows exactly where he is and that he is alive. He's making his way home. She knows the full truth. But instead of that, she's real cagey. She says, um, well, you know, I think he is. But you really need to go see this old guy, Nestor, who lives far away. And it's going to be a dangerous voyage. And you really need to get a good ship and a good crew. And it's going to be an adventure, you know, and it's a big risk. But you'll ask him and he'll know. But if he doesn't, there's this other guy. You can go, it's even harder to get to him, but he'll know for sure. She knows, and she's not just telling him what he wants to know. Why? Telemachus thinks he needs information. Athena knows he needs transformation. That's what Stoicism is all about. Not just providing information, but providing transformation. Now, the Stoics have all these techniques. They're mostly about how to keep your head when everybody else is losing theirs. So here's a picture of Marcus Aurelius before he learned enough of the techniques. This is from the Cleveland Museum, I think. There's some stoic techniques we want to talk about this morning, and they're very important. They've had a big impact on me. I know they've had an impact on, on, on Greg. And we also say at the beginning of our book, Stoicism for Dummies, you know, half of wisdom is about knowing what to embrace and what to release. Most people go around embracing things they should release and releasing things they should embrace. We get it all mixed up, and the Stoics want to advise us, want to guide us on how to get the embrace-release dynamic right in life, which will make things much simpler and will make us much calmer if we know what to let go of and what to hold tight to. Well, they have all these techniques. We talk about 16 in the book, and I'm just going to touch on, on them briefly here. Number one, live in the present moment. You know, we, we have no control over the past. We have no control over the future. The present is all we have. Most of our worries come from the future. Most of our regrets and resentments come from the past. If we focus on the present, we'll avoid most of those. I see Joe's got his hand up. Let me run through a few more of these, Joe. I don't want to get to you for sure. Adopt the view from above that Greg just talked about, right? I just talked to an astronaut recently. I met a bunch of astronauts a few weeks ago. And there's this guy, Tom Mashburn, who's done more spacewalks than anybody else, more minutes outside the International Space Station. And he said uh, when he sets, stands in the airlock, slipping into his suit, he said there is a moment of terror and dread before the hatch opens and he goes into the great beyond. But he uses his training, he focuses his mind, and he said the fun, the hardest thing for an astronaut doing a spacewalk, it's great to look at the Earth from the window, but when you're out there to turn around from the space station and look at the Earth, he said it's a scary thing, and it puts into perspective everything else. The night that Ukraine was attacked, they saw the bombs exploding in Ukraine, the fires over Ukraine from the International Space Station. Number three, look at the situation objectively. This great dinner I'm having to pay so much money for, it's just a dead bird. You know, it's just wine is just grape juice. Marcus especially is always reducing the situation to its objective components. Don't get too excited about stuff. Don't get too, too worried about stuff. Look at things objectively. Don't use values to impose on the situation. Just see it as it is before you react. Cut people some slack. Hardly anybody wants to offend you, wants to insult you. Yeah, they're jerks in the world, but they're hurting themselves, not you, unless you give them that power. Take a walk on the wild side. Our friend Ryan Holiday stresses this in one of his books, and you, you don't really find it that much in the Stoics themselves, but there is a passage in the Meditations where Marcus talks about the beauty of nature. He obviously took walks in nature. He obviously appreciated nature. And I think he appreciated the way that can calm us. The other day, I was worried about something, and I took a walk in a natural setting, and I, immediately I felt better. Keep the Stoic basics ready to hand. You know, there are all these little aphorisms. There are all these little epigrams. 
they're all catchy. Some of them are actually accurate. Some are a little inaccurate, but they put you in the neighborhood of a great insight. Keep these with you like a surgeon keeps his tools ready to hand, like a carpenter keeps his tools ready to hand. Keep these little sayings ready to hand. These, How does the Epictetus manual start? Some things are within our power, other things aren't. Didn't take a genius to realize that, right? But it almost takes a genius to apply that insight in daily life. Keep them ready to hand, these basics. Number seven, anticipate possible adversities. My dad used to tell me as a, when I was a little boy, what would you do if the car you were in rolled over on its side? What would you do if a dog started charging at you, looking like he was going to bite you? What would you do? My dad wasn't trying to scare me to death. He was trying to prepare me for possible things that could happen. The Stoics realize with this preparation, torium malorum, right? Prepare for the, the possible bad. Not believing the bad will happen, but anticipating it so it won't take you by surprise. Most of our negative reactions are due to surprise. Number eight, practice morning and evening meditations. Greg just talked about the evening meditation. Marcus liked to, to do it in the morning, too. You know, he liked to think about all the difficult people he was going to come across in the day, right? So that they wouldn't irritate him so much when they actually walked in the door. He wasn't expecting the day to go bad every day. Well, on his worst days, maybe he was. But he was trying to take away that element of surprise. Number nine, start journaling. That's the, the big Marcus example, right? And do you notice he starts chapter one or book one with just gratitude? Gratitude to everybody who's ever done anything good for him? When we start with gratitude, everything else is a little easier. When we try the practice of journaling, Stoics have suggested... We form our thoughts in new ways. Number 10, act with a reserve clause. Don't just say, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. But think to yourself, God willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Fate allowing, destiny providing, I'll see you tomorrow. Always have a reserve clause in mind. And that way you can conform yourself more to the way things happen. Not always in our control. And it's not just the Stoics who talk like this. The Bhagavad Gita, this great Hindu wisdom about focusing on the process and letting go the results. Uh, we focus on results too much in our culture. It's only by focusing on the process that we have a good chance of getting the kind of results we want. Always have that reserve clause. We may not always know what's best for us. If we get our goals, they may not be good for us. So have a reserve clause in your wishes and your desires. Practice voluntary discomfort. All right. I'm not real big on that, but okay. I can, I can, I can sleep on a floor now and then. Uh, because why? Because then you'll know not to fear poverty the way so many people do. Yeah, I can live on bread and water. Yeah, I can sleep on the floor. Number 12, contemplate impermanence. It's this weird paradox about contemplating impermanence. First of all, it helps you let go of things. Everything's going to disappear. It helps you let go of things, but then it helps you appreciate things while they're here. It's this weird, it's this weird deal. Number 13, adopt good role models, like the Stoics themselves in, in many cases. Focus on what you can control, not what you can't control. Boy, this was big for me in appropriating Stoicism into my own life. It was amazing to me when they kept confronting me with this distinction between what's within our control and what's not, what's within our power and what's not, what's up to us and what's not. And they talk about it as if it's an on-off switch. Well, maybe it's more like a dimmer switch. Maybe it's more like a spectrum. But still, the insight is really important. The things that we have the most control, the most power, the most influence on, yeah, focus on those things because you can get things done. I've come to think the more you focus on things, the more you uh, increase your sphere of control and power. You expand it. Curb your desires for externals. We care too much about external things. It's the internals that matter the most. And number 16, one of our questions is going to be on this, practice amor fati. Uh, a term only used later for not just accepting what happens in the world around us, but actually embracing what happens in the world around us. Some of them say, love everything that happens. Do we have to go that far? That's going to be one of our questions today. That's my time for now. Oh, yeah, I forgot the final technique. I can't forget this. Find yourself a good book and do some reading.